I would like to start with a short story. So there was a man named Ben. Ben went to his preacher, whose name was Heath, and he said, hey, I would like to meet with you at the coffee shop. There's something I need to talk with you about. Heath went there and found him, and at the coffee shop, they had a small amount of small talk, but he got right to the point. He said, I'm struggling. My life is full of sin, and I've prayed about it. I've gone to older men in the congregation about it, and even still, I only find sparse victory. He asked, why was change eluding me when I've done what I've been told? You see, Ben was doing some things right. He was praying about it. He was going to other people in congregation about it, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. But his sparse victory, when mixed with a sincere effort, led to a lot of discouragement. His best wasn't actually changing his life. He was still finding himself in sin. Why was that? Why was Ben still living in sin? He was so focused on the sin in his life that he never really looked at where the sin was coming from. He was focused on the symptom and not the root cause. Uh, turn to James 1. James 1. Uh, I'm going to read 14 and 15. But each one is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desires. Then when desire conceives, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. Uh, I'll be reading out of the New English translation uh, this morning. So, we spend a lot of time uh, talking about this verse sometimes. And we look a lot at the second half of 15. Sin leading to death. And I think that's good because those are two very bad things. We definitely don't want sin. We definitely don't want death. But we don't really look at where the sin comes from. Read that again. Each one is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desires. Then when desire conceives, it gives birth to sin. You see, we don't really struggle with sins that we don't desire. There might be someone in here who struggles with really wanting to drink alcohol or someone who really struggles with lying. But one might not struggle with the other. It's because they don't desire that. And then, once we desire that, that's what gives way to sin. But we spend so much time talking about the sin and the death that we don't talk about the desire for it. You see, Ben, from the introduction, his main trouble was that he desired the sin that he was struggling with. He was doing all of the steps to try and fix the sin, but he never worked on trying to fix his desire. So what is it that you should desire? Uh, turn to Matthew 6. This is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Well, I say the middle. It's really towards the beginning of it. But. Matthew 6. Uh, starting in verse 19, Jesus says, Do not accumulate for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and devouring insect destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But accumulate for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and devouring insects do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So when you look into your heart, what is it that you desire? Perhaps your first thought is, I really desire a pay raise. Or I really, really want a new car. And I don't think there's anything wrong with wishing the best for your family. But if that's your first desire, perhaps something's wrong. Should our desire not be seeking the lost, encouraging the brothers? You see, when what we're seeking after is earthly materials, Jesus says that it's also fleeting. There's a lot of tragedy found in desiring the materials of the earth because moth and insects destroy, people steal it. It's temporary. Say you get that pay raise. Most of the time, it's not going to carry you through the rest of your life. Two years down the road, you're going to want a new pay raise. Say you get a new car. It only has that new car smell for so long. It doesn't last. But then past that, desiring those things, what if your friend gets the pay raise instead? Now there's some amount of animosity between you and them. Why did he get the pay raise? I've spent so much time working at it. I've put so much effort into this job. Why didn't I get that? 
Say you haven't gotten a new car, and you see someone driving down the interstate, and they're driving mean, and you say, why does he get the car? Why can't I have that? The desire there gives way to the sin of covetousness or divisiveness. If your first desire isn't for that, but instead for the soul, then there isn't going to be the animosity between you and him. If your first desire is to get to heaven with that person, then there isn't going to be hatred between you and them because they got something that you didn't. Instead, all you're going to be seeking after is your eternal home with them. I'm happy that he got the pay raise because now he can do something more with it. He can help those who are in need. He can do this, he can do that, not, why didn't I get it? So you say, Jonathan, that's well and good, but how do we change what we desire? Uh, turn to Romans 2. Romans 2. Here in Romans 2, uh, we're talking about, uh, well, Paul's talking about circumcision. So under the Old Covenant, they had uh, circumcision, the sign of the covenant. And largely it was intended to show that they were in covenantal relationship with God. Uh, we're going to read verse 25. For circumcision has its value if you practice the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So you want to change what the desires of your heart are. And... What they tried to do was use the outward sign to change the inward man. And I'll give you a little spoiler for the Old Testament. The Israelites didn't do that. Instead, they repeatedly broke the law. And now what was supposed to be a sign of their covenant with God became a sign of the ways that they broke their covenant. It's still a sign of the covenant, but it's a sign of their broken covenant. Now, the outward sign that's supposed to remind them of who they are reminds them of the ways that they've fallen short, and their heart isn't changed. Go to Deuteronomy. Here in Deuteronomy, Moses is talking about the actual purpose behind circumcision. Deuteronomy 10. I'm going to start in verse 12. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you except to revere him, to obey all his commandments, to love him, to serve him with all of your mind and being, and to keep the Lord's commandments and statutes that I'm giving you today for your own good? The heavens, indeed the highest heavens, belong to the Lord your God, as does the earth and everything in it. However, only to your ancestors did he show his loving favor, and he chose you, their descendants, from all the peoples, as is apparent today. Therefore, circumcise your hearts and stop being so stubborn. The real point of circumcision was to affect the heart. It was supposed to be an outward showing that makes them change inwardly. And they didn't do that. I think, I think we try and do that on a pretty regular basis. We try and change the outward man and hope that it changes the heart. I've been struggling with this sin, and if I can just fix that one, then my heart will finally seek and serve God. And just like with the Israelites, it doesn't work. It's like, it's like you have a leaky roof. You could either slap some duct tape on that roof, or you could just change the shingle. Perhaps the duct tape will work through a mild storm, but when a heavy thunderstorm comes by, the duct tape's not going to hold. So you can try and spot treat the sins in your life, or you can change your desire. Go to John 14. It's a very simple verse, but, well, I think it's rather applicable. John 14, 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's talking about the motivation behind your actions. You see, if what you're motivated by is love for God, then the obedience will follow. Oftentimes, we try and mix those. If I'm obedient to God, then I love God. There's this, there's this great article that I read. It's called Motivated by Love. It says, I think, okay, I've got the love God part down. 
So now I need to focus on being more and more obedient to prove it. It's right there that I fail to get the emphasis right. I gloss over the motivating role that love plays and focus on what I need to do instead. I mistakenly assume that my love for him is what it should be. The verse is meant to tell us what the key to obedience is, which is love. You see, Ben, from the beginning of this lesson, in all of his willingness to treat his symptoms, he never addressed the root cause. He could be fighting day and night to change the sin in his life, or he could change what it is that he desires. You see, I think we as humans are made to play into what we desire. We desire something and we work really hard at getting it. But if what we desire is sin, then we find ourselves at, a, well, a crossroads in our life. Our inward man is fighting against what our spirit knows is right. But if we change what it is that we desire, then you don't have to fight yourself anymore. You can just lean into serving God. So once you change your heart into loving God, from there, the outward change will be apparent. Go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Uh, it's a long passage, so I just picked out uh, some of the verses that I need. Uh, so I'm going to start in 17. So I say this and insist in the Lord that you no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. Uh, now drop down to verse 22. You were taught with reference to your former way of life to lay aside the old man who is being corrupted in accordance with deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new man who has been created in God's image in righteousness and holiness that comes from truth. And now drop down to 28. The one who steals must steal no longer. Instead, he must labor, doing good with his own hands so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. You must let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only what is beneficial for the building up of the one in need, that it would give grace to those who hear it. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You must put away all bitterness, anger, wrath, quarreling, and slanderous talk. Indeed, all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. So, Paul was telling the brethren at Ephesus that you can't live as the Gentiles do. And if you remember, Ephesus was not in Israel. He was writing to a bunch of Gentiles. You can't live like you used to. How they used to live was corrupted by their deceitful desires. And I think it's interesting that Paul uses the word deceitful there. All throughout our life, we are really corrupted by our deceitful desires, right? Even back at the beginning of time, Eve in Genesis 3.6 saw that the fruit was desirable for making one wise. So she took an ate. And arguably, that was the most unwise thing that she could have done. Before her were the choices between trusting God's wisdom or trying to get her own wisdom. And her desire for her own wisdom deceived her into thinking it was the right choice. When God had only one rule for Eve, don't eat the fruit. And yet her desire deceived her into thinking that it would be okay. And then the serpent used that desire to trick her. Instead, you have to put on the new man, not being deceived, but in the image of God, which was created in truth. You see, I think Saul is a great example of this. He spent his early life, well, early life, he spent the early part of his known life to us, persecuting the church. And then he was stopped on the road by Jesus and informed of what was true. Saul put that off. Never again did he persecute the church. Instead, he spread it to all nations. He put off the old man and put on the new, and he never again desired what it was he was doing. I think that's the image that we should be striving for. Oftentimes, we get baptized into Christianity, and 
we still struggle with a lot of the same things. We're struggling to put off the old man. Really, we've been raised to walk in newness of life. We don't have to carry around the old man anymore. And you say, Jonathan, that's well and good. But what does that look like? I think David is a great example of it. Turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Uh, it's a very well-known psalm. Uh, right after David uh, sins with Bathsheba, he writes this psalm. There are a couple of verses that I want to call out from this. Uh, verse 10, 16, and 17. Create for me a pure heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Certainly you do not want a sacrifice, or else I would offer it. You do not desire a burnt sacrifice. The sacrifice that you desire is a humble spirit. O oh God, a humble and repentant heart you will not reject. You see, David could have gone to the temple with his burnt sacrifice, and he could have offered it to God, and everyone would have seen David and said, wow, what a humble and repentant man. Truly, God has forgiven him. But within his heart, he could have just not changed. In fact, that's what a lot of Israelites did. Like, if you read Isaiah 1, God was so fed up with all of their false sacrifices. Their hearts never changed. They just went through the motions of it. And he said, I don't, it makes me sick. It makes me sick for all of these motions of burnt sacrifices. You're following the law, but not the point of the law. David could have gone through the motions, but he doesn't. Instead, he recognizes what it is that God wants, a humble and repentant heart. Because if David can have a cleansed heart, he won't have to struggle with the sins that he was. He lusted after Bathsheba. He murdered Uriah. He won't have to deal with that anymore if his heart changes. Go to Romans 6. Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to remain in sin so that grace may increase? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that as many as were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through the baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may live a new life. For we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. We will certainly also be united into the likeness of his resurrection. We know that our old man was crucified with him so that the body of sin would no longer dominate us, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For someone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that since Christ has been raised from the dead, he's never going to die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires, and do not present your members to sin as instruments to be used for unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead, and your members to God as instruments to be used for righteousness." For sin has no mastery over you, because you are not under law, but under grace. You see, the old man has been killed. You can lay aside all of its desires, and sin will have no mastery over you. Jesus paid the price. But yet, I still find myself dragging him around. It has no mastery over me, but I choose to hold on to the old Jonathan. All of the desires and all of the weight, I carry it around with me. It has no mastery over me, but I can still choose to carry it with me. And Paul says, should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? And he says, absolutely not. Instead, lay aside the old man. Let sin have no mastery over you. You see, Ben, from the introduction, he was struggling. He was trying to do the things that people told him to do to rid his life of sin. And that's good, but he stopped short of what he should have done. 
What he should have done was change his desire so that he doesn't have to fight himself every day and rid his life of sin once and for all. Change the shingle, don't do patchwork. What he needed was a deep clean in his life, not the surface treatment. So you might find yourself struggling with sin. You might really be struggling. And you've been trying to do what people around you have told you to do. You've prayed, you've gone to your friends, you've asked them to bear your burdens, and you only find sparse victory. That's really discouraging. But I have some good news for you. If you haven't been baptized, you can lay off the old man. No longer will sin reign in your life. You can put aside the old man, all of his desires, and you can also put aside the debt. You don't have to carry around the weight of the debt that you owe, because Jesus also paid that price. If you've already been baptized and you're dragging your old self around, let him go. You don't have to hold on to the old man anymore. In fact, he's already dead. If you let go, his hand isn't going to be holding yours anymore. So if there's anything that we can do as a church to help encourage you to do that, we would love to. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. No one here is perfect. If there's something that we can do to help you, whether that's baptism or prayer or study or checking in with you through the week, let us know. Let us help you. I praise you with all